All right, good morning. My name is Mary Puckett and I'm the acquiring editor for archaeology books at the University Press of Florida. Um, I'm happy to welcome everyone to our webinar today where we'll be talking about UPF's book series, The American Experience in Archaeological Perspective. Today's webinar will cover the history and goals of the series and the publication process from the perspectives of me, the acquiring editor, and an author in the series. Um, I have some notes and pointers for today's panel. Um, first of all, this webinar is being recorded. After the webinar, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel, Florida Press, and registrants will receive an email after the webinar with a link to the recording. Um, closed captioning has been enabled for this webinar. To view the closed captioning, please click on closed caption in your meeting controls. If you have questions for the panelists during the presentation, please put your question in the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed in the Q&A session after the presentation is finished. I would now like to welcome our panelists. Michael Nassani is Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at Western Michigan University, and he is founding editor of the American Experience in Archaeological Perspective series. Krista Rizuski is Chair and Associate Professor of Anthropology at Wayne State University, and she is co-editor of the American Experience in Archaeological Perspective series. Jane Eva Baxter is Associate Professor of Anthropology at DePaul University, and she is the author of The Archaeology of American Childhood and Adolescence, which is included in the American Experience in Archaeological Perspective series. To start us out, founding series editor Michael Nassani will give us a brief background of the series. Michael? Great, thank you, Mary. Uh, and thank you, uh, fellow panelists for joining me today. Um, so we're about 15 years into the series now. Um, the genesis of the series was uh, circa 2003, 2004. And, um, you know, the idea behind it, um, you know, at the time I was involved in uh, curriculum development at Western Michigan University in the area of American studies. And again, I'm trained as an anthropologist, as an archaeologist, as a historical archaeologist. So uh, this was new to me, but um, I always considered myself an Americanist. And I got to interact with a number of other colleagues from other disciplines and helping to sort of define and shape what American studies would look like at, at at WMU. And it became clear to me at that point that the work we were trying to do there had a tremendous amount of overlap with the kind of historical archaeology that I was familiar with. Um, there were so many themes that were uh, significant in, uh, and foundational uh, in the American experience. And uh, many of these themes uh, could be, were being illuminated by historical archaeology. So uh, we proposed this to the press, and in 2007, uh, the first couple volumes came out. Uh, since there have been some uh, 26 volumes over the last 15 years, and uh, each, you know, as the description um, in the books and on the website and anywhere you search for information on the series will indicate is, uh, is you know, a series devoted to examining the settings, the processes, the institutions, the places, the events that were foundational for the American experience uh, to understand those events through a material lens, through an archeological lens. And um, the, uh, we've published uh, two or three volumes each and every year since then, there's been a, a steady flow. And um, it's, uh, it's been tremendously gratifying for me to work with the authors, to solicit the works. Uh, I've written forwards for all of the books. And um, I'm quite proud at this point of, of sort of this, this corpus of work, this, this body of work uh, that I think, had, I think has made a contribution to moving uh, historical archeology span uh, in the US forward. Um, so um, I'll just say quickly, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Krista, who can talk a little bit more about uh, where we are now. Um, I recently retired from the university. That gives me a chance to devote even more time to the series. Uh, and at the same time, 
uh, it seemed to me that having uh, another perspective uh, on um, various topics, someone who was positioned differently in the discipline who could solicit manuscripts from people I wasn't familiar with uh, would be a good idea. And so in the last couple of years, um, Chris has come on as, as my co-editor and I'm, and I'm so pleased. Uh, but I will say that during the, the pandemic, how can you not talk about that, right? Um, I issued a series of invitations at the very beginning of that in March, April, May of 2020. Okay, so you're sequestered. Uh, how about writing a book for the series? And there was a tremendous uh, response. And so um, over the course of that period, shortly after Krista joined us as well, and then together she and I uh, have solicited a number of volumes uh, since then. Um, and so, um, even though uh, maybe some of the classic themes of uh, gender and farmsteads and the fur trade and urban life and, and so on, uh, you know, have been uh, explored, various identities, childhood among them, uh, race, race and racialization and so on, have been explored through the series and I'm leaving so much out. Um, there are other other avenues, there are other corners, if you will, there are other um, ways that historical archaeology is growing, expanding, and interrogating uh, what it means to be uh, an American, however defined, and what constitutes the American experience. Um, so um, I'll turn it over to Krista, and she can talk a little bit about um, uh, where we're at today and our, uh, our current, our, not only our current vision, but sort of our future vision as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, your your flurry of activity in early 2020 coincided with with me coming on board as co-editor. So I was only ever introduced to a pace of of recruitment for this series that uh, <clears throat> was operating at breakneck speed. But uh, that's been an excellent introduction to the editorial work that um, uh, the series involves. And Currently, we have 15 books in preparation um, under advanced contract or, or uh, in the final stages, in some cases, of um, editing. Uh, and so there's a whole array of, of topics that are on the horizon uh, for publication in the next uh, two to three or four years. And they include um, the archaeology of of home and homelessness. I believe that's our next one to come out by um, Dan Sayer. Uh, archaeology of health and medicine, archaeology of plantations, contemporary archaeology, foodways, protests. Um, and we've also started to build out the underwater and maritime archaeology representation, because as we know, the American experience doesn't stop at the shoreline. So we've got a couple uh, coming up on shipwrecks and Great Lakes maritime archaeology. And you know, there are, there are an infinite number of topics that we can uh, weave into the American experience and, and use to um, foreground different, different books for the series. But uh, when I got uh, involved with editing, we also started to test the waters with uh, books that have either a, a regional or state or geographic place-based focus. So there's a whole nother um, uh, kind of fork in the road with the series uh, that, that's going to be coming out in the next couple of years. And our authors are currently preparing books on um, a number of different places around the country, um, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Florida, um, some bigger regions like the South Atlantic and the Pacific Northwest, but you know, with, with 50 states and territories within the United States, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, room to build that avenue out too. Um, so that's just kind of a sneak preview of, of the 15 books that are, that are on the horizon. Um, but we are very much in tune with the developments uh, in scholarship in historical archaeology and in the discipline of anthropology more broadly. And we're also in tune with the um, societal issues that matter uh, very much to our colleagues in historical archaeology. And, and we, in, in our subfield, tend to be on 
um, what I think is the leading edge of connecting archaeology to uh, and demonstrating archaeology's relevance to um, social issues and our society and applying historical archaeology to chart courses for more equitable and accountable futures. So um, to that end, we are actively recruiting or interested in recruiting books that um, focus on issues of social justice and violence, um, migration and immigration, diaspora communities, uh, environmental topics, food justice, um, you name it, uh, all of the, the major issues that are in the headlines now. And um, the books take, you know, a couple years from conception to, to publication. So there's always a little bit of a, a time lag between the archaeology of what's happening now and the archaeology, the scholarship that'll come out a few years down the road. But the, the, um, this series allows us to really shape the conversations that are, are moving the discipline forward because the, as, as Mary will talk about in a minute, the, the design of the books, the intended audience of the books, um, I should say that the books are designed to be research tools to some extent, but they're also written in, in sort of an overview of the, the topic at hand so that they also make for great teaching tools. So a lot of, um, a lot of the books that uh, people are familiar with in the series, they've, they've encountered in the classroom. So they are suitable for undergraduate and graduate level um, teaching. So the, the topics that will be um, recruiting on in, in here and in the coming year, uh, we uh, intend to be part of scholarly conversations and, and training for students of historical archaeology. Um, so I, I'll be happy to answer more questions as we get into the discussion about the future of the series and where our priorities lie. But I will turn it over to Mary now, who is, I believe, going to talk a little bit more about the mechanics and process of publishing in the series. Yeah, thank you, Krista. So um, as Krista mentioned, I'm the um, editor who works with the series editors. And my role is to shepherd manuscripts through the review process and final publication approval. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how that works at UPF. Um, and I'll be following along our life cycle of a book infographic, which is available on our website. Um, and this uh, infographic breaks the publication process down into three basic parts. Um, the first part is the acquisitions part. So that's the part I'll probably spend the most time talking about. Um, and then also editorial design and production, and then finally marketing. So I'll start by sharing my screen. All right. So the first step that prospective authors should take is to prepare a proposal. Um, authors are welcome to contact Michael, Krista, or myself with any questions related to developing your proposal. We're happy to answer questions about potential topics, things like book length, images, or anything else. Um, and there are also several documents available on our website that outline what the press requires authors to include in their proposals, such as an updated CV, a description of the project, your anticipated timeline for submitting the manuscript for peer review, and a writing sample. And I want to note here that the series editors and the press do not have requirements related to the timeline, um, and authors are welcome to propose a writing schedule that works for you. So once your proposal is drafted, you can send it to Michael, Krista, or to me, and I'll forward it to the series editors. Um, and Michael and Krista will then work with you to develop your proposal so that it fits in with the series. Um, and Krista just kind of mentioned that books in this series all follow um, kind of a, a similar formula in that they're overviews about specific topics that are frequently used for um, teaching in the classroom and are often used as really helpful kind of um, guides for other archaeologists who just need to learn a lot about a specific topic. Um, they're usually written in a very accessible way and there are other other aspects of these books that um, you would want to talk to Michael and Krista about just to make sure everything fits in within the parameters of the series. 
Um, so when your proposal is ready, Michael and Krista send it to me. And at that point, I work on securing a publishing contract between the author and UPF. This process typically takes two to three weeks. Once the contract is signed, you as the author will work on writing the manuscript. And this process can take several months to a few years, depending on what your schedule is like. When the manuscript is complete, you send it to me and I work to secure peer reviewers and I send the manuscript to Michael and Krista for their review. And when all the peer reviews and Michael and Krista's reviews are ready, I send the reviews back to you, the author, and I'll include a letter synthesizing the reviews and I'll highlight what I think are the most important revisions to make. The peer reviewers and series editors frequently request revisions. And if so, you then take the time to revise your manuscript before sending it back to me for a second round of review. Once the reviewers recommend publication with minor or no revisions, we can proceed to the next step, which is final publication approval from our faculty editorial board. Once we have approval from the board, uh, I can work with you as the author to prepare your final manuscript and gather any other materials um, for example, permissions and things like that. I'll, I'll guide you through that process um, for a transmittal, or we call it a launch meeting into our editorial design and production department. So the second phase, this is the editorial design and production phase. Um, we call this EDP. Um, and this is where manuscripts are made into books. This is where the manuscript is professionally copy edited, um, where it's typeset, and printed from the printer. And the final phase of the publication process, or we, we say it's the final phase, but um, is the marketing phase. And this is when books arrive in our warehouse, the marketing department uh, will send review copies to journals, um, we'll send it for display at the appropriate conferences or nominate it for any relevant book awards. Um, and I would just say that this timeline is a little bit deceptive because the marketing department actually releases metadata for the book and will start to make pre-orders available even before the book arrives in our warehouse. So let me just stop the screen share. Next, um, so that was a brief overview of the publication process from the press's perspective. And now Jane Baxter is going to uh, talk to us a little bit about her experience publishing in the series um, from an author's perspective. Jane? Thank you so much, Mary. And I wanted to thank um, both Michael and Krista for inviting me to be the representative of an extraordinary list of authors that are in this series. Um, it's, it's really an amazing group of people to be associated with in a, in a publication series. So many really talented scholars, at the top of their field. Um, and it was really nice to be a part of that. So um, I would just sort of as a N equals one here, I'm happy to answer questions. So, you know, in the Q&A, please feel free to ask more questions of me as an author. But what I wanted to say were a few things. Number one, Michael asked me to write a book on childhood and adolescence right at the beginning of this project, sort of in this 2003-2004 time frame. Um, and I was getting ready to have my first book on the archaeology of childhood come out. And I, I told him, I said, I, I have nothing left to say. <laughs> there hasn't been a lot of historical archaeology on childhood done, and I wouldn't want to write a book that was levying a critique on the field for why aren't y'all jumping on board and doing this childhood thing. Um, and so that was great. He said, when you're ready, let me know. And um, in 2016, I said, I'm ready. <laughs> and I went through this um, proposal process. And it was really wonderful because I could set my own timeline. And even once it was set, you know, I'm in that sandwich generation where I have, you know, parents who are aging and who are doing things unpredictably that require some of my time and it affects my ability to produce things on schedule. And every time I said I need a little bit more time, I need a little bit of it, everybody was very understanding and helped nurture the book. So I will say the that aspect was wonderful. As an intellectual exercise, I found writing for the series really interesting. Um, echoing a lot of what 
Michael had talked about is sort of entering into an American studies sort of idea. Um, we were taught, or at least I was taught in the 1990s about how global historical archaeology was. And that was one of the things that really distinguished it. And all of a sudden I was being asked to say, what is American about this the experience of childhood. And it was a really exciting and invigorating intellectual endeavor to, to sort of take this global set of material culture, these global sets of ideas and ideas of connectivity and really drill down and look at other kinds of literature and say, how do I make this an American story? And I loved the intellectual challenge of that. Um, I will also say that by waiting, I was not one of the brave members of the first wave of a new book series, and I had the benefit of seeing um, a lot of books in the series come out and have the experience of how am I actually using these, you know, and sometimes it really was, I need an overview before I attend a talk or before I give a lecture, but I found myself assigning these books to students or giving them to students saying, you're doing a paper on this, you start here, right? So it really helped infuse me with a sense of audience for writing. So both the idea of writing is teaching and writing is a big open accessible form of communication, and also writing about America and not just childhood was just, they were both really exciting sort of ways of reframing my thinking about very familiar topics. So I would recommend it from that perspective alone. It was really an engaging project. Um, in terms of working with the University Press of Florida, this is one of several presses I've worked on with books. And I will say it was an absolute delight. Again, I was given a lot of freedom and understanding um, believe it or not, the copy edited manuscript was rigorously copy edited. I've had issues where copy edited books are coming back to me where there's no copy editing that's been done. And it's really, you know, you're struggling to make your work something you feel good about when the press isn't investing in it. I felt that my book was heavily invested in in terms of making sure it read well. It was a good example of scholarship to share with students and colleagues and the public. And I think that's critical when we think of the audience for these things. Um, so I was very pleased with that process as well. Um, and then finally, I will say, you know, the University Press of Florida is a great promoter of its work. I mean, we're at a webinar today and here I am and my book is on flyers and my book is a catalogs and the University Press of Florida is very present and active at conferences. So, you know, those sort of three component parts that Mary talked about acquisitions, production and marketing, my perspective as an author is that it was seamless. I was shepherded through the different departments with ease. Um, and I was included in all parts of the process and that I found it was really effective for producing something I'm, I'm really proud of um, as an author. And I'm really pleased that it's a part of a series with so many excellent quality works and it's the result of this process. So um, that's really what I had to say. And I believe that I'm the last speaker. <laughs> We're gonna transition towards uh, an ability for people who are here in the webinar to ask us some questions. So. Back to our host, <laughs> who I think is going to field those for us. Yes, thank you, Jane. That was lovely to hear. Um, really appreciate your thoughts as an author. Um, and you're right. Yeah, and now we're going to transition to the Q&A portion. So um, at this time, we can take questions from the audience. Um, do we have anything at this point? OK, got one. Um, this is for Michael and Krista. Are there any specific topics you are interested in publishing for on for future books in the series? Krista, you want to address that since you started to talk about a, a few that are in the pipeline and and you and I have had a conversation about um, you know some areas we might we might go uh, we might explore more closely. Um, and also um, part of the conversation we had was we're really looking to see what what is uh, intriguing potential authors as well, but go ahead, Krista. Yeah, sure. I kind of alluded to some of these already, but um, you know, Michael and I have our, our personal preferences and um, as, as professors, we uh, are keenly aware of the topics that our students are, are wanting to know more about. So where there's demand right now, and I would say um, certainly a book on um, the archeology span of, of social justice or civil rights in America would be high on the list. Um, there's been quite a lot of work done even in the past two, three years on the topic. So uh, I think somebody could, could pull that together in a way that's attendant to contemporary issues. Um, a book on 
native North America. We, we don't have much representation um, in a standalone volume on the role of um, indigenous people in the historic period or contemporary archeology. span And so I'd really like to see at least one, if not more books focus explicitly on, on native communities, um, uh, environmental topics, anything to do with uh, environmental justice um, and uh, climate change, the, some of the issues that are affecting uh, the, the archaeological record with respect to um, disasters and flooding and things like that. That's maybe a more practical focus. Um, there's certainly a lot of room to build out uh, books around themes of diaspora and immigration with respect to uh, different affinity groups or communities or ethnic groups um, or in one as a whole. Um, all of the issues that have been coming up about accessibility and ableism in the field lend themselves to, to more thought, I think. Um, and uh, we're also looking for a volume that focuses more on uh, violence and different types of structural and um, uh, other types of violence and warfare. Um, but really we're open to people's suggestions. And we're, we, we have an agenda and we are pursuing uh, recruiting in the, the areas that we're most interested in and where we know there's a demand, but people are doing really interesting work in corners of the country that we're not as well versed in. So we are always open to, to suggestions and proposals that maybe combine some of these topics in novel ways or, or are entirely focused on, on different ones. So. Yeah, when you mentioned uh, diasporic groups, uh, Chris, there are a couple that immediately come to mind with the, all the work that's been done on the Chinese diaspora, for example, uh, uh, the Irish, right? I mean, so there are great case studies, uh, but then to examine, I mean, not only the Irish in New York City, and but also in the, in the Detroit area, and then also in South Bend, and, and you know, a number of different areas and so forth, and compare and contrast, and then uh, ultimately answer the question, so what does this group contribute to the American experience and how does archaeology shed, shed, light, shed light on that? Yeah, and I, also to add to that, um, something that we haven't really mentioned but is, is, is worth considering is that just because a book has been written about gender or something or ch childhood in the series before doesn't mean another one can't be written that has a different different spin or focus on it. So if, if a book has been published already on a topic that prospective authors are really uh, attached to, we'd be willing to, to hear their proposal for a, a reconfiguration of a, a book on that topic. All right, thank you. Um, the next question um, is, what is the general word length for manuscripts and how many illustrations typically? Um, I'm happy to answer this, but Michael or Chris, I'll let you, I'll give you the opportunity first. Yeah, go, go ahead, Mary. I, I'm not good at, with uh, with the word length part. I mean, I, I tend to think in terms of manuscript pages. And <laughs> so they've been, you know, typically, and again, you know, 12 point font, you know, typical Times Roman or whatever, uh, you know, on the order of 180 to 200 manuscript pages. And we've seen anywhere from like 20 to 25, uh, 25 to upwards of, 35 or 40 images, a few tables sometimes are appropriate as well. What is what is 180 or 200 manuscript pages translate into words, Mary? I'm going to make you do that quick math. Sure, I can only do it because I know it. Um, I don't have to do math this time, but uh, that typically translates to about 75,000 words. That's usually what um, we what the contract length for for word count is for books in this series, um, and that's usually the right length for, um, as we've said, kind of we want this, these to be approachable books and books that are appropriate for, for students even. And so it's a nice manageable length for a book, but it's not, it's not too long and not too involved. And that's usually plenty of space to explore the topics. Um, and as Michael mentioned, the number of images um, really depends on the project. Uh, we, of course, prefer that images, we all, the authors only include images that are really necessary for their text, but we can, we're certainly flexible and able to talk this through with authors because some projects will require more images than others. And so that's really a kind of a variable thing. Let me add, if, if I could, Mary, that, um, 
you know, we have a couple of sample proposals too that we've we've sent out to prospective authors, and I think they'll find prospective authors will find those um, quite useful. And I, I think uh, as one of you might have mentioned, maybe you mentioned Mary, um, it's not so much as a formula, but uh, there there are some similarities in the structure of, of the book. So I think if prospective authors look at a few books in the series, they'll have a sense of, you know, the introduction obviously just lays out the parameters of the study. There might typically be like a theory, a theory chapter overviewing different approaches. Um, sometimes um, sort of a, a historical take on the phenomenon in question might, might constitute a, a separate chapter. Uh, and then maybe two or three chapters could explore some some uh, salient themes within that particular topic. Uh, there's often near the end then a, a, a case study uh, that would illustrate sort of best practices, if you will, in in exploring the archaeology of childhood or farmsteads or alcohol or tobacco or urban life or whatever it might be. Um, and then just wrapping up in a, in a concluding uh, chapter. Uh, but there's considerable variation within the series as well, but that's just one, one sort of general model, certainly the model that I use, for example, for the fur trade book, but it's only one of many possibilities. And we're certainly open to uh, creative ways of approaching uh, the subject matter. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Michael, um, because you're right, there is, there is a considerable amount of flexibility as far as the, the structure of the books of books in the series. Um, so I, when I said formula, I don't mean it to sound so, so structured, um, but they do kind of follow the same, they wanna stay, we want the books to stay on the theme of the American experience. That's really the most important thing. Yeah, there's, there's that. And also these are meant to be like go-to books, right? I think Krista mentioned this. And uh, so if, if you're, in, you're thinking of delving into now the archaeology of childhood in a way that you hadn't done before, it, you have to start with Jane's book. I mean, that's, that's where you start, right? Because she's going to, in that book, she's going to explore a panoply of approaches to childhood and so forth. And it'll, it'll ultimately lead you to, to think about you know, your data set, if you will, or you know, in a way that um, you hadn't before. So. All right, I'll move on to the next question. Um, this is a two-part question. So first for the series editors, can you talk about the process of developing a proposal? In what ways do you work with authors on this? And then for Jane, can you describe the process of developing your proposal with Michael so that your book worked in the series. Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the meetings we've been having with prospective authors as of late? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, we kind of already uh, touched on this a little bit, but just to expand on, on the process of develop, developing the prospectus, um, as Michael mentioned, once uh, prospective authors reach out to either one of us, uh, we usually schedule a meeting by Zoom, uh, which is very convenient, and we'll listen to the ideas the prospective author has for their, their project. And um, the, the first thing we do is usually share some of the model prospectuses with them. And um, then they'll go and, and come back to us in a few weeks or months time with a draft prospectus. And that begins the back and forth process between Michael and I and the prospective author. So um, we, we will comment and edit the prospectus and maybe have another meeting or two to flesh out some points, but usually this is not a laborious uh, project. It, it can be done rather quickly if, if the prospective author has a clear vision in mind for um, a book that fits within the series. The, I would say the number one um, comment that Michael and I have on uh, the prospectuses are that we really push the, the authors to articulate very clearly how the topic speaks to the American experience. And sometimes, you know, being, being a good critical thinkers that we are, some prospective authors might push back and say, well, you know, this, this theme or topic doesn't fit squarely within the, the contemporary boundaries of the United States of America. You know, the geopolitics can't be mapped onto this theme. And we completely get that and we agree. And many of the books in the series transcend 
the boundaries of, of the US today um, and take into consideration North Atlantic or Canadian examples. Um, several of the books touch upon examples from the Caribbean or are even uh, uh, mainly focused on that region. So we, we take a kind of um, uh, expansive view of America. And it's not the the last thing the series is meant to do is to assert or enforce some view of American exceptionalism and that the archaeology of childhood in America is 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 more special than the archaeology of childhood somewhere else. So um, that would probably be the number one uh, piece of feedback that Michael and I work with prospective authors on how to articulate and shape that vision. Um, but it's a fairly straightforward conversational editorial process and the prospectus itself, the document is oh, no more than 10 pages when the bibliography and the audience and all of those uh, components are included. So um, that's a pretty, pretty enjoyable process for, for us. Um, so I'll let Jane answer the, the next question of what it's really like, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it meshes. Yeah, thanks, Krista. No, I think that that's absolutely it. That it was really easy to come. I mean, on the one hand, I will say I was coming to this not having to convince Michael to do a book on childhood and adolescence. He had asked me to do a book on childhood and adolescence. So it's easier to start when you know that this is something that's already of interest. I will say that. So just framing, but um, and also the press has so much information. I mean, you know, Mary, you were really easy, easily able to articulate the guidelines the press has for the book. So if that's the case, you actually go in really knowing what it is you're writing towards as an author, if you want to be a part of the series. And I found our negotiation pretty, pretty easy. I mean, you know, um, I had a pretty strong idea of sort of where the literature was I could speak to. And, um, and we really went from there. But I, I mean, the proposal process took not very long at all, I will say, a um, couple months really to, to hammer it out. And it was making sure that the ideas that I had were gonna fit within the framework. And again, emphasizing the fact that this was a book about American childhood in, in some way um, that, that really mattered. So um, I, it was a really easy, straightforward part of the process from my perspective, yeah. Thanks, Jane. Um, the next question is, do authors need to have previous publications or any other qualifications to have their proposals accepted? I think that's for Michael and Krista. Yeah, well, let, let me say that, as you mentioned, Mary, uh, part of the, the proposal process is to include a CV. Uh, so, I mean, typically the authors have been uh, post PhD. Uh, so you know, someone who's already written a dissertation. Uh, so, you know, having written one myself some time ago, I mean, that, you know, that's a, that's a sizable task and that demonstrates certainly some, some writing ability at that point. Um, I don't think anything we published has been like anyone's dissertation though, right? That's because again, a dissertation would have more of a thesis. These studies don't so much have a thesis. They'll have a perspective, but not so much a thesis. Now, one's literature review, right, certainly could, in a, in a dissertation, certainly could be expanded into, and then maybe the, you know, the, the focus of the dissertation as a case study. So, I mean, I think that's, that's probably the way that uh, that would work. Yeah, and just to, to add to that, um, we having a having a dissertation under one's belt is is certainly an advantage for um, being able to write a volume in the series, but it, series, but it's not it's not required. We've actually been recruiting um, a diversity of authors from um, various uh, professional sectors. So to date, the majority of the the published volumes. Uh, have been written by academic archaeologists, but there are a fair number there uh, where the, the authors are based in museums or in government positions. And among the books we have in the pipeline, there's a very good representation of um, archaeologists based in cultural resource management as well. Um, and in some of those sectors, museums and CRM, a PhD isn't always necessary to be a, a practitioner. So 
Um, we do welcome books. We think it's very important to have authors who represent the full spectrum of professional historical archaeology. Um, so we have the different voices and um, the, the authors are also at uh, various stages in their careers. Sometimes uh, this project appeals to uh, folks at Michael's stage who are uh, recently retired or about to retire who are really keen to do a synthesis of a topic they've worked on for a very long time. Uh, sometimes a newly minted PhD is, is the person who tends to be most current with the literature. Um, and we also invite people to co-author volumes, and we have some really exciting pairings of, of co-authors where there is a, a senior person in the field with a, a junior person, and the senior person's in academia, and the junior person's working in a museum or something like that. So that invites a, a really uh, kind of great synthesis and energy into, into the writing process. Um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to include every all the different uh, opportunities for, for the types of authors we recruit. I'm glad you qualified that, Krista. Um, uh, yeah, as of late, certainly some, some folks from the CRM sector will be participating in. And I'm, I'm sure based on looking at their CVs that they've you know, written thousands and thousands of pages and so forth. So, so yeah, having obviously some writing experience in advance would be, would be useful. Okay, the next question um, is how much time does the peer review process take? Um, I can respond to this with a non answer really, um, because it takes um, it takes that depends, I think on um, sometimes with archaeologists, it depends on the time of year, you know, if a lot of archaeologists are in the field, um, and a manuscript goes out for review in the summer, the report may take longer than than usual. Um, I usually ask for reviews um, to be returned in eight to 10 weeks. Um, but if, as we all know, in the last two years, anything can happen to disrupt that timeline. Um, so there are things like that we have to consider. Um, and another thing to consider is your own schedule as an author. And so if you're asked to do revisions, um, a lot of that time is dependent on, on what is what you what resources you have available to work on the manuscript. Um, so the peer review process, as I said, I typically ask reviewers um, for eight to 10 weeks, but I'm happy to extend that timeline. Um, we try to be flexible with both authors and peer reviewers. So um, yeah, it just depends and uh, could be it could be anything, but we, we do our best to get reviews in in a timely manner. Yeah, typically, um, let me add just maybe that, you know, typically authors are, are asked to recommend a handful of reviewers as well. Uh, and so that can then can help in the process. And then uh, Mary will use that list as well as, um, you know, her own devices and identify a couple of people. And, and then, uh, you know, I mean, Krista and I, Krista and I, I mean, I, I think she feels this way. It's in our interest to turn these things around. I mean, this is not something we want sitting around for six months. So, you know, we usually get to it within a couple of months and uh, our reports are written and we, we hope the others are in as well. And when they're all in, uh, you can make the assessment. And, uh, you know, having had some experience publishing with other presses, as well as certainly in, uh, you know, in peer reviewed journals, uh, I think this is a fairly expedient process at Florida, I would say. Thanks, Michael. That was a nice perspective to have. I don't have that. Um, all right. The next question is, given the number of books in the current queue, are you going to maintain the past rate of one to two books per year, or will you publish more per year? I think that's for Michael and Krista, but. Yeah, let me say something, Kristen, and you can, you can jump in too. Um, you know, basically, we sort of turn them out as, as quickly as they as they come in. I mean, even though we solicited uh, and signed, as Krista said, some 15 contracts over the last year and a half. I mean, these are all not going to come in, obviously, in the same month. I mean, these are all going to be strung out over a, over a number of years and so forth. Um, I don't think the press is limiting us right to two per year. Um, you know, but I suspect that given the general flow and and the delays that just come into 
the normal course of doing business. I would think if a couple came out each year, two or three each year, I think that's probably what we would expect. Uh, but don't let us, we're not, we're not lit. Don't let that limit you. Uh, you know, if, if a fourth one is ready to go, it, it will, it will go. So. I think in, uh, in 2019, four came out in one year. So there's, it's, it can be done and um, it, it's really up. Ultimately it's up to the author's pace um, that they set for themselves and in, in completing the book and responding to the reviews in a timely manner. We don't have any quota that we're, trying to fill or limit. Um, and in the prospectus stage, we leave it up to the author to define when they want the book to be published. And it's perfectly okay. You know, we're not pushing a year from now in every case, this is not, we, we don't wanna force the product. We want a quality submission and we want people to take the time they need to, to develop that. So uh, it's not uncommon for authors to say, oh, I'd like two or maybe even three years to produce this book and we're perfectly happy with that. So yes, we do have a lot of books in the pipeline, but um, some of those authors have, have strung out their deadlines till 2023, 2024. So it's, there's not, there's not gonna be a glut on the market um, in, in the near future. Let me offer this too. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the books are released in, in, hard, in hardcover. Uh, all the books are now released in hardcover. Um, and, um, I would say the, the, the run is typically fairly low. It's about 300 books and it's obviously sold to many libraries that have standing orders. And what I like to think is authors, uh, uh readers who just have to get their hands on this book. Uh, and it's also, uh, the press brings it to the meetings. They discount it by some 40% at the meetings. Uh, so these books are, are quite accessible. And once they sell out that 300, they go immediately to paper. Uh, so this has been the case with most of the books in the series now. Um, within a year, they come out as paper for whatever, $24.95. And, and so again, that's, that's how that part works too. And they're also available as um, eBooks in a lot of university libraries, universities, uh, even my university, which is not plush with resources, uh, uh, can afford to buy a subscription to the, the, the eBook series, which is really convenient for teaching. Thanks. And yes, just to confirm, we don't have, the press doesn't set a limit on the number of books in the series that are published each year. So um, we'll take what, whatever, whatever's ready. Um, all right, I have what I think might be our last question for all of us. Um, are there any misconceptions about the series or about publishing a book that authors often bring to the process? So what's, I guess, the most common misconception that, um, that you have to talk, to talk authors through? I could start if you want. I, I think it's the it's the timeline question is something that I get a lot of when I talk to prospective authors. There's a lot of anxiety about um, not being able to produce a manuscript or a proposal right away. Um, and as we've all kind of discussed, um, the press and the series editors are are very flexible. And, and what's more important to us to get a quality proposal and a quality manuscript and um, book publishing is kind of a long game. So we understand that things take time. Um, and, and it's okay if you need to, or if we need to work around your schedule, we're happy to do that. Yeah, I think most, I think most of the authors that, that I've engaged in, uh, either I've solicited a manuscript from them, or if they've approached me, they have some familiarity with the, with the series. So I think there's a pretty clear sense of of what the, what the expectation is. You're right about the timeline uh, piece, Mary. And I think when we explain to folks that they're working on their own schedule uh, and that we're not gonna hold it up on this end. I mean, when they, you know, when, when we're working with folks with a proposal, for example, somebody sends it to me. I mean, particularly now I'll get to it within 48 hours. I mean, I'll just look at it, make comments and, you know, and share it with Krista and we go back and forth once or twice. And, you know, they hear from us within a few days. So and then it's up to them to make the revision. So uh, the timeline piece is not, is not bad. And Krista touched on the issue of the American experience and, you know, not to, um, 
you know, not to beat that into the ground, but um, I mean, I think there is, again, just coming back to where I started off from, uh, you know, within the lower 48 and adjoining territories and added states and so on, there is this core of American values of individualism and a range of others and so on that have structured these larger global processes. And so I think, uh, as, as Jane eloquently explained, when she sort of got her head around or began to engage with the idea of what is Americanist about this phenomenon, in her case, childhood, right, then I think uh, that, that sort of liberates the writing, I think, to fit into the series in a way uh, that, that uh, allows the author to demonstrate that Sure, there's childhood and there's farmsteads and there's alcohol and drinking everywhere, but it takes on a specific cast because of legal issues and political issues and economic factors and geographic factors and so on within this particular space that we define as American. And I think once people come to terms with that, uh, I think uh, they get it and then it flows from there. Yeah, I would add from my own uh, perspective to, to these uh, kind of misconceptions is that and this is one I actually had before I, I got involved with, with editing and got to know the, the process a bit better. I was always under the impression that the series was invite only, that you know, Michael had to come and find you and, and invite you to, to author a volume on a topic that he already had in mind. And, and he's very good at doing that. And he has a lot of ideas. So I thought, oh, wow, he's so productive. And what if, what if other people have ideas that they could bring to the table? And I realized immediately that I was the one in the wrong here, but um, it is not an invite only series. Yes, we do invite people. Michael and I go to the meetings and we, we listen, we, comb the program and look for topics and, and perspective authors that way. Um, so we are act proactive, but um, we are also very happy to receive um, inquiries from people we don't know and topics we haven't thought of. Jane, is there anything that, um, that surprised you when you uh, started or worked on your book for the series? I don't, I don't know that there was, um... Anything I found surprising, except for what I talked about before, which was really the excitement of being able to think about a topic in a way that allowed it to exist in the series. Um, and I will say the series in no way felt prescriptive of how I was supposed to approach the topic in any way. So I, I think um, I was able to explore the relationship between America and childhood and write a manuscript that made it make sense in light of the scholarship and in light of the available material. And, um, and yeah, that, that's what I would say is that it, it was really, um, it was, it was, I had to reshape the topic, but not in ways that didn't feel appropriate and useful and really exciting, frankly, as, as an author. So yeah, that, that's what I would say is the joy it was as an intellectual project was a lot deeper and more complex than I thought it was going to be than writing another book about the archaeology of childhood. It was a really different process. It was great. All right, I think that's our last question. Um, Michael, Chris, or Jane, are there any uh, final thoughts you'd like to add? Well, I would just thank everybody for participating and for uh, uh, providing questions and so forth. And uh, uh, we look forward to any, uh, any, any ideas that you come across and uh, we'll certainly take them seriously and we love to work with you. So thank you all. Uh, thank you all too. This has been a great conversation and I think a, a great resource for prospective authors and we look forward to, to chatting with all of you. All right. Thank you. Um, as Michael and Krista said, thank you to everyone who attended and thanks to my co-panelists for this informative presentation and discussion. Um, as Michael and Krista emphasized, please feel free to reach out to the series editors or to myself if you have any questions about a proposal or just want to talk something through. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and some concluding notes that I have um, are a link, as a reminder, a recording to the webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, Florida Press, and a link to the recording will be sent to all webinar registrants next week. 
um, and to receive updates about books published in the American Experience and Archaeological Perspective series and other books published by the University Press of Florida, you can visit um, upress.ufl.edu forward slash subscribe and sign up for our email list in the subject of archaeology. Um, and I think that's it. Thank everyone again for attending and have a great weekend.